Hi everyone. I'm sure you have heard of uh, the terminology hybrid financing or mezzanine financing. And you could guess the, the meaning of like mezzanine. Uh, usually if you go to a building and if the building says uh, like mezzanine floor, it means that it's a floor in between. Okay. So mezzanine is something in between and so is uh, uh, hybrid financing. So um, in accounting and finance, we know that we usually finance or uh, fund our assets using liabilities or debts and or equity. So it could be 100% equity, it could be a combination between uh, liabilities and equity. And with the advancement of uh, financial world, financial markets, we have more alternatives uh, in terms of financing and uh, mezzanine or hybrid financing uh, has been increasingly more and more popular because of uh, uh, their flexibility and also uh, vast options uh, as to uh, what to use and uh, which provides more flexibility and also uh, lower cost. So that would be our uh, discussion today. That is about the, the hybrid financing. And today um, we are going to discuss like, three major types of hybrid financing or mezzanine financing, the preferred stock, and then uh, warrant and comfortable bond. So we'll start with our preferred stock. Okay, so. So we'll start with our preferred stock. So what is, uh, a preferred stock again. Preferred stock is somewhere or something in the middle uh, between uh, pure debt and also uh, equity. That's why we call it that preferred, preferred uh, stock. Yeah, preferred stock. <clears throat> so, uh, so preferred stock is not uh, not pure equity, but not liabilities either. So it's something in the middle, and uh, I think this is. Uh, an important option for uh, like financing to a firm. If you can imagine here, we have uh, in accounting, we have liabilities. We have uh, <clears throat> uh, any any kinds of payable, uh, bank payable, bond payable, notes payable, and any kind of uh, uh, debts or liabilities to our creditors. And then we have equity and now we have uh, uh, something in the middle, and one of one of the examples or uh, our discussion right now is about preferred stock. So we have preferred stock again. Uh, this is not pure equity, although the name is stock. Uh, in accounting, of course, we include preferred stock into the book of equity, but again, in finance, uh, we are more. I think we are more. Uh, like practical, so preferred stock is not pure equity, and you see uh, some of the differences right now. So preferred stock. So what are the characteristics of preferred stock? First one is about the uh, dividend. Right, preferred dividend. Preferred dividend has a similar nature as uh, interest expense. So uh, most likely when when you, you issued a preferred stock, maybe two years ago or five years ago or 10 years ago or yeah, any time uh, before, usually a preferred dividend would be mentioned or would be promised uh, in the contract or in, in the covenant. For example, it, uh, it might say uh, that the dividend rate is 10%, at 10% of uh, the face value. So if the face value, Let's say the face value is one thousand. 
then every year the preferred dividend would be about 100. So usually uh, the, the preferred dividend is mentioned and promised in the contract or in the covenant. On the other hand, uh, this one, you see the, the common equity, common equity or common dividend doesn't uh, give a certain percentage number or amount right, in the in the contract. So common dividend uh, uh, is, is not obligated or the company is not obliged to pay the common dividend. But most likely the company is obliged to pay the preferred dividend. Right? So it has a uh, it has a similarity in this aspect with liabilities, right? So preferred stock uh, is paying usually uh, a determined or predetermined amount of preferred dividend every year, or even every six months. Okay, so uh, that's the the first difference between the preferred stock and uh, common common stock or common equity. So with respect to dividend and uh, secondly, the the definition of owner uh, in accounting and finance is strictly the common equity holders, like common equity holders. So preferred stockholders are not owners. So they don't have a voting right. They don't have any voting right. So if uh, there's a general meeting or uh, like proxy, uh, that proxy voting, uh, only common stockholders have the voting right, whereas the preferred stockholders don't. Okay, so you see, this is <coughs> something in the middle. Right? It has some similarities to liabilities, but also some similarities to uh, common equity. So let's see again here, what, what are the uh, uh, main differences uh, what is the main difference between preferred stock and liabilities right now? So in uh, if we use liabilities or debts, then you have to pay interest expense. And the interest expense, uh, interest expense, uh, no, it's an obligation, right? So uh, let me put it this way, right? The first question is for, for the case of liabilities or interest expense, do you need to, are you obliged to pay the interest expense? And the answer is yes. Right? So you are, if you, if you owe uh, money to someone or a, uh, a company, then you are obliged to pay the interest expense. The second question is, are you obliged to pay the interest expense on time? And the answer is yes. Right? So you're obliged to pay the interest expense and you are also obliged to pay the interest expense on time. What about the preferred dividend? So preferred dividend, again, is an obligation. Usually this is stated or mentioned in the covenant. So you, you know for sure that it would be like certain percentage point of the power value and you have, you have to pay it maybe every six months or every year you know, or any time frame, uh, you know, uh, agreed upon in the contract. So first question, do you need to pay a preferred dividend? The answer is yes. A second question, are you obliged to pay the preferred dividend on time? The answer is no, because you could delay it. Uh, you could delay it, right? So uh, uh, if the uh, timeline to, to pay the preferred dividend is in June, um, and maybe you don't have money or you don't want to, to pay the preferred dividend right now, you could delay it to December or maybe next June, right? depending on the contract. Uh, maybe you delay it to December. If you delay it again in December, uh, sorry, if you if you pay in December, then you have to pay the uh, deferred dividend from June and then the dividend for December. But if you delay it again in December and decide to pay the next June, then you have to then you have to pay the deferred deferred dividend from June and then deferred dividend from December and then the preferred dividend for June next year. So you could, you know, essentially you could defer it, you could delay it. Right? So, uh, but you cannot eliminate the dividend altogether, right? So it would be like a uh, deferred, you can call it a dividends in error. Right? So you, you defer it 
What about the uh, common common dividend? Are you obliged to pay the common dividend? And the answer is even no. No, you, you are not even obliged to pay the common dividend. So you see here, again, preferred stock stands in the middle between liabilities and equity. So it has some similarities to liabilities and also uh, some with uh, common equity. Okay, so let's go back here. So here's another thing. So most preferred stocks prohibit a firm from paying common dividends if the preferred dividend is not uh, fully paid or still in arrears. Right. So uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, what's that, the, the legal position, preferred stock stands above the common stock. So preferred dividend has to be fully paid before a company could uh, pay out the common dividends. That's usually the case, but again, this depends on the covenant uh, when the company issued the preferred stock. So many preferred stocks are perpetual, some are not. So, uh, have to see the, the uh, contract uh, case by case. Uh, most new issues have sinking fund. Uh, sinking fund is like the uh, allocated funds, uh, peri periodical allocated funds uh, saved by the company to make sure that they could fulfill their obligation. They could repay uh, the preferred dividends and also the face value of the dividends if this is not perpetual. Right? And some of the uh, some of the preferred stocks also have call provisions. The so call provisions. So a call provision means uh, this is the right to recall the preferred stock before its maturity. For example, if the company issued the preferred stock for uh, for a maturity of, of 10 years, but the contract says that there is a call provision after six years, it means that after six years, the company has the right to recall the preferred stock before its maturity, which is 10 years, right? Okay. So again, it might have like sinking fund, the uh, promised or allocated funds by the company right, to make sure that they could repay the preferred dividend and also the, the face value. Again, preferred stock doesn't have a voting right because the owner, uh, the stockholder, the preferred stockholders are not owners. However, uh, if, if a company stops paying the preferred dividend or uh, fails to fulfill the preferred dividends, then uh, according to the, con the, to the contract, there's a possibility that preferred stockholders will uh, immediately be changed into common stockholders, if there is a possibility, uh, depending on the contract. <coughs> so what are the uh, advantages here? So dividend obligation is not contractual. Uh, this is not entirely true. 99% uh, uh, of the time, a preferred dividend is an obligation. Right? So uh, the company that is uh, issuing the preferred stock is obliged to pay the preferred dividend. Right? However, you could delay it. You could uh, defer the payment of the preferred dividend, but you're still obliged to to pay it, right? but you, you could delay it only. Avoid, uh, you could avoid the dilution of common stock, this is true. So by issuing uh, the preferred stock, again, the status of the preferred stockholders is not owners, uh, they are not owners. So by issuing preferred stock, you get additional money, right? By selling, by issuing the preferred stock, but the existing common stockholders are not diluted because the incoming money comes from preferred stockholders who are not owners because they are not common stockholders. So you could avoid the dilution of common stock. And also this one, if you issue uh, the perpetual preferred stock, then you don't, you will never pay the principal. This is so true, right? So if you issue, uh, simply issue the um, perpetual preferred stock, 
then you will never repay the principal because it will last uh, forever. Let's see the disadvantages of preferred stock. Preferred dividend are, are not tax deductible. Uh, it depends on the, the country. Okay, so uh, let's show you here. Actually, in the next page. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is true uh, in general that preferred, preferred dividend is not tax deductible. So typically it costs more than that. So let me show you again here. If you talk about the income statement, the typical income statement, you have revenues, uh, you have cost of goods sold, or cost of sales, then you have gross profit, then you have the uh, indirect operating expenses, right? the operating expenses, indirect operating expenses, including depreciation and amortization expenses. You get the, uh, you get your operating profit and uh, your plus minus other income or, uh, losses, other incomes or losses. Then you get your earnings before interest and taxes. Okay, and then uh, you deduct interest expense, you get uh, earnings before tax or taxes. Again, some countries have, uh, the United States has uh, state and also federal taxes, but in other countries, they might have only a single tax system, so earnings before tax or taxes. And then you minus the uh, tax, you get the net income. So here, if you borrow more and more, if you borrow more and more money, uh, then you pay higher interest expense. Right? So the higher interest expense will lead to lower, a lower EBT, and also a lower tax payment. Right? So your taxable income will be lower, and uh, so will your uh, tax payment. Right? But See, preferred dividend is paid out out of here. Right? Preferred dividend and of course common dividend later. So it is paid out. It's paid out of net income, so it doesn't affect the uh, taxation anymore. That's why this is not tax deductible. It doesn't affect the uh, the amount of tax that you have to pay, unlike the uh, interest expense. And also, uh, indirectly, this increases financial leverage. Again, this is not, not leverage, right? Because again, leverage is your uh, debt, especially your long-term liabilities. Uh, because you no know, leverage is related or uh, intertwined with uh, fixed payment of something, like fixed, fixed cost type of uh, financing. Like uh, you have to pay, uh, a coupon, right? Uh, you, have, you have to pay your uh, coupon, a bond coupon. You have to pay interest expense to a bank, right? Or uh, other types of uh, interest payments to other creditors. But here, somehow, if you issue a perpetual preferred stock, you have the fixed obligation. Again, this is not called a debt or a liability, but still, in essence, uh, you're obliged to pay a like, preferred dividend every every period, maybe every year. And somehow this is very similar to financial leverage, right? Because now you have the fixed obligation to fulfill, uh, which is the uh, preferred dividend. And uh, directly, this will also affect the cost of common equity because now the uh, common equity holders um, because of the increasing leverage due to your issuance of preferred stock, they'll feel uh, less safe or they'll, they'll feel riskier and thus increasing um, the required return that they want. And the required return by common, common equity holders or common stockholders is the cost of equity. And you see the logic again? If you use more and more preferred stock, somehow this uh, 
constitutes the uh, fixed obligation, very similar to leverage, how, how the leverage works. So uh, the common stockholders will feel, uh, will perceive that the risk has gone up and they will ask for more return. Right? So the required return by common stockholders will increase as well. And the required return by common stockholders is the cost of equity. Okay, so you can see the direct effect of issuing preferred stock to uh, the cost of common equity even. Uh, there's another style, floating rate. So uh, the discussion that we just conducted uh, just now was about the uh, fixed rate payment, right? fixed rate preferred dividend. But in many cases, I mean, modern times, we have also the floating rate uh, preferred stock. So what about the uh, taxation here? So you see in the United States, only 30% of dividends are taxable to corporations. So uh, if you're a company, if you buy another company's preferred stock, right, and then you get a preferred dividend, only 30% of the dividend is taxable. So 70% of the dividend is not taxable. So this is good news. And uh, essentially this makes uh, the issues of preferred dividend more attractive. So see it again. Uh, if you're a corporation or you, if you're a company and you buy another company's preferred stock and, and uh, at certain time you receive the preferred dividend from that company, right, paid out by that company, then only 30% of the dividend is taxable. Right? You could imagine if you receive, for example, uh, uh, maybe uh, whatever, 50 cents, so 50 cents per the stock, right? per preferred stock that you have. And let's say you have uh, uh, 100,000 preferred shares, so uh, obviously you get how much? 50,000, right? So you, you, the, the, the amount of your preferred dividend would be 50,000. So only 30% of this preferred dividend is taxable. So only 15,000 of it. Only 15,000 of it is, is taxable. So this is good, right? And in other countries, of course, in many countries, Many other countries, uh, the, the regulations are different. Right? For example, uh, in Indonesia, so if you're talking about the uh, Indonesian tax system, uh, if you're a, a, a company, uh, you're a corporation, or even a cooperative, a cooperative or a credit union, if you buy, uh, if you buy another company, And you buy another company's uh, preferred stock, okay? And then, so you buy, uh, say, company company B's uh, preferred stock, and you receive preferred dividend. Now that uh, there's two possibility, if you own more than twenty five percent, then your preferred dividend is tax free. Oh, pretty cool, right? So if you have more than 25%, right, 20, 25% ownership or more, then the preferred dividend is not taxable. Right? It's, it's, yeah, it's essentially tax-free. But of course, if you own less than 25%, then uh, the preferred dividend is not tax-free. But still, the, the tax rate is not, not that bad. I mean, in certain countries, right? Okay, so I think in a country like Indonesia, the uh, uh, dividend tax rate uh, it's about 15% for, for company and 10% for individual. So it's, it's a, like a flat rate for uh, its final rate, not a progressive rate. Again, uh, so in Indonesia, if, you, if you're a company or even a credit union, if you own uh, another company with uh, ownership of more than 25%, 25% or more, then the preferred dividend that you will receive from that company will be tax free. Okay, so floating rate. Uh, usually, you 
uh, is what's that the floating rate is tied to a certain index, maybe inflation index or uh, London interbank offered rate or something like that. So, so I hope it's quite clear about the uh, about private stock because we're, we're going to continue to the second type of mezzanine financing, right? which is warrant. warrant. Okay, so now let's continue with the second uh, form of hybrid financing. Uh, so we see Warren here. <clears throat> so what is Warren? Warren is similar to uh, call option, like similar uh, in nature or in characteristics to a call option. Right? So what is Warren here? Warren usually... Uh, uh, this is like complementary with uh, bond issuance. Uh, so again, Warren is similar to call option. So this is the right to buy, the right to buy uh, a company stock in the future at a certain price right? uh, within within a certain period of time. So you see, you, you can see this uh, easily by imagining if you. Uh, if you go to buy groceries, maybe you buy uh, a certain brand of detergent, right? So the promotion says that if you buy this detergent, you will get uh, maybe two packs of instant noodles, right? So you can imagine the situation. Uh, so you buy the detergent, but you get you get uh, bonuses of instant noodles, right? So this is similar. So bond with warrants. If a company issues a series of bond plus warrants, it means that if you buy the bond, you will get the warrants. And what is warrant again? This is the right to buy, right? call option, right? The right to buy the company stock within a certain period of time at a certain price. Okay, so we'll see an example here. Uh, we have a situation a case here, a 20 year bond with 27 warrants. So you can imagine, right, if you buy this bond, the maturity is 20 years, and every bond is equipped or is, uh, is complemented with 27 warrants. Right? And each warrant has a strike price. Strike price, this is the exercise price, right? exercise price in option, right? So obviously here, the, the strike price is 25. It means that uh, yeah, and the maturity is 10 years. So the bond's maturity is 20 years, but the warrants, uh, the warrants maturity is 10 years only. So you have the right to buy the company stock at $25 a piece within 10 years. Okay, so you could imagine again. Right? So the bond itself will mature in 20 years, but the warrant uh, will last for only 10 years. So you have the right to buy uh, with uh, with every warrant that you get, you have the right to buy the company stock at $25 a piece within 10 years. Each warrant value is estimated to be $5. So actually this is like a arbitrary, you could start with $1, but here in this case, we know that uh, the initial price is $5. And warrant is also traded on a stock exchange. So you could see, this five dollars will change, right? Five to six, five to four, and and so forth, right? So you could even start with one dollar. Doesn't really matter because uh, this will only affect the number of warrants that you have to issue, right? Uh, yeah, uh, based on your initial price and the amount of money that you want to get later if they uh, exercise or they strike their warrant. Okay, so. Uh, Additional information here. So this is a nice thing about academic world, right? Because uh, all information is is well provided. I mean, in real life, nobody will tell you any of the information. So you have to uh, look for and also make your own projections. Okay. So, but here we know that the cost of debt right, of a twenty-year annual payment bond without warrants is ten percent. So 
here I think we're doing comparison. If you look at uh, another series of bone with a 20 year maturity, uh, with similar risk characteristics as our company or our bond, that other bond is paying or is having a yield of 10%. So the RD is the cost of debt, right? Cost of debt, cost of debt is the required return by uh, creditors right? or bondholders in this case. So this is again, uh, the required return by bondholders. So we are doing a comparison. We look somewhere else. There's another bond that has uh, similar similar risk characteristics as our bond, this bond right, to be issued. And uh, the other bond also has a 20 year maturity. So similar characteristics, similar maturity without warrant. That other bond, right, the other bond issued by another company is having a yield to maturity of 10%. So we assume that uh, if we issue the bond right now, right, and uh, our bond has similar risk characteristics to that one, then most likely the coupon payment that we have to uh, pay right now, right now, if you issue it right now, will be similar to that one, similar to that of the other bond, right, which is 10%, okay? So again, one more time here, uh, the cost of debt or the required return uh, by bondholders uh, on this bond is 10%. So the pure bond without warrant. <clears throat> so first question now, what coupon rate must be set on the bond with warrants to make the total package sell for 1,000? So we still want to sell it at 1,000, uh, but now it has, see here, we have two components here uh, that they are sold as one package, but there are two components: the pure bond, or you can call it, <coughs> you can call it straight bond, and the second component is the warrant. Okay, or well, maybe let me continue first. So there are two components here: the value of the pure bond or the straight bond, and the value of the warrant. So we have two components here. And based on uh, the information that we got, uh, each warren will start selling at five. And how much is it again? How, how many warren? How many warrens per bond? 27 warrens. Right? So every bond is equipped with 27 warrens. So we know that for every bond, uh, the value of this would be uh, what? Uh, 135. Right? 27. 27 warrants per bond multiplied by the value of each warrant right, at the beginning. So 135. So we want to sell it at 1000. Then what would be the value of the pure bond? Of course, it's the remaining value, right? 865. <coughs> so imagine again, you have the whole package. You want to sell it at 1000. So the value of the warrant itself from this, from this information is five dollars a piece for the, the uh, warrant price uh, the initial warrant price is five dollars a piece and every bond is equipped with or complemented with 20, 27 warrants so it's 135 so you want to sell it the total value is 1000 so the value of the pure bond or the straight bond is 865 so now you could uh do it here what what should be the coupon rate so you know that here is what 865 the the, the failure of the pure bond by 865 and at the end of uh, 20 years you will get 1000 so how much is the uh, the coupon rate right coupon rate and you see here the information the cost of debt, the cost of pure debt, right? The cost of pure debt without warrants, right? Without warrants is pure, pure bond. So the cost of pure bond, again, this is the required return by uh, bondholders without warrants, right? Pure bond is 10%. Obviously, this is using <coughs> a comparison with 
uh, a similar bond somewhere else with uh, similar risk characteristics. And that somewhere else is paying 10%. So here we uh, incorporate the information. So your uh, cost of, yeah, maybe cost of uh, pure bond, cost of pure bond is 10%. Okay, so we can put into calculator. But if you imagine we are looking for the coupon, right? How much coupon we have to pay, right? Okay, so uh, of course, uh, if you want to calculate by hands, this should be that this is the present value, the current price, and then the payment here, right? So payment, uh, first payment divided by one plus. Uh, the cost of pure bond, right? Cost of cost of debt, cost of pure debt, ten percent in our story here, to the power of one, and then the MT two. To the power of two. And the PMT should be the same. Oh so, yes, yes. Uh, and so forth. And the last one is PMT 10. To the power of 10. And of course you get the uh, 1000. The face value. 1 plus uh, cost of pure debt to the power of, oh sorry, 20, 20 here, 20, yeah, right, so let me make clear, this is not 10, but 20 periods, okay, so we put into a calculator, so we are looking for Great. Oh, sorry. We are looking for payment. We're looking for payment. <coughs> uh, the cost of debt, cost of pure debt is 10% in this case. Uh, 20 periods. And what is the current price again? 865. So we are buying the bond. So it's minus, right? cash outflow you buy the bond right so cash outflow and you get 1000 at the end <clears throat> so 84 14 so the payment uh the coupon payment would be 84 14 all right 84 14 okay so 84 14 is about uh, 8.41% or 8.42%. This is a coupon rate. Be careful, coupon rate. Well, this one is the market rate or the cost of debt, cost of pure debt without warrant. Right? Cost of pure debt without warrant. So generally, warrant will sell in the open market. This is so too. You can uh, buy it through your brokerage firm. If you have a brokerage account, uh, this is sold at at uh, any stock exchange right, in your country. Uh, and warrants tend not to be exercised until just before expiration. This is so too also. I think this is uh, mostly because of human psychology. So you can imagine uh, this is like call option. Right? And in our case, the strike price is 25. So you could imagine that uh, if the price right now is uh, 20, the, the real stock price is 20, and you have the right to buy at the strike price, you have the right to buy at 25. The current stock price is 20. So will you execute it right now? Of course not, right? Not because you have the right to buy at 25. But the real price, the real stock price right now is still 20. So it's not, uh, not worth doing, right? So... Uh, this is still out of the money, not not yet in the money. So you will wait, 
by your way. However, uh, let's imagine that uh, the real price right now is 30. So think about it. <clears throat> you have the right to buy the stock at 25. And the current stock price is actually 30. So it's profitable enough, right? It's profitable enough to execute the stock right now. It's already in the money. However, you see, human psychology usually uh, yeah, has some, some uh, you know, how to say it, like uh, some greed in it, right? So most people, uh, knowing that you still have a lot of years of opportunity, right? For example, you, have, you still have 10 years ago. Most people will wait because we are thinking that the stock price might increase again. So again, bear with me, right? You have the right to buy the stock at 25 and the current stock price is 30. So immediately, if you do it right now, even you already get a profit of $5, right? Like we get a, a quick gain of $5 a piece. But most likely you wait because you are seeing that you still have like 10 years to go. And who knows, the stock price will keep increasing. So you wait anyway. So this is all too. See the statement here, right? Tend, the warrants tend not to be exercised until before expiration. So if it is out of the money, you'll wait anyway because it's not profitable to execute it right now. But even if it's already profitable to execute right now, you'll still wait because you think that the real stock price will, will keep increasing and you'll get more money, right? So you wait anyway. What about the stepped up strike price? Stepped up strike price means that the uh, strike price is uh, increased right, in the contract. This will be increased every year. So this is not interesting right, to a buyer. You could imagine that right, we have 10 years ago, uh, year one, the strike price is 25. Let's say year two, the strike price is 26. Year three, the strike price is 27 and so forth. So <clears throat> with the passing of every year, you see uh, increasing strike price and this will make it less attractive, less interesting to, to a buyer because it's getting more and more difficult to strike. You see, right? Uh, let's say in year three, the strike price has increased to 27. Uh, then it will be more difficult to gain money because uh, you have to, if you want to exercise the, the warren, you have to pay uh, 20, $27 per stock, uh, which is more expensive than 25 at uh, two years earlier. Okay, so this is an interesting to buyer, the stepped up strike price. So will the warrants bring, bring in additional capital? Of course, right? Because uh, uh, you can imagine within 10 years, uh, if all of, let's say, majority of, majority or all of the warrant holders exercise uh, their contracts, then we'll have like, uh, how much money coming in? $25 per stock multiplied by the number of stocks exercised or the number of stocks uh, uh, no, uh, sweetened by or exercised by the warrant holders. <coughs> so strike price is typically set some 20 to 30 percent above the current stock price of course right so we saw our simple example before if this is 25 the strike price is 25 and the maturity of the warrant is 10 years then uh, the current price might be maybe 15 or 20 or 17 maybe. So when we get the warrant, this is not ready to strike, uh, not ready to exercise because to be exercised because if we exercise the warrant, we have to pay $25 a stock, whereas the real stock price right, right now is only 17. So we still have to wait. So you cannot imagine that if the current stock price is already $35 and you issue a warrant with an exercise price of 10, 25, then everybody will, will sell anything that he or she has to buy the warrant and they immediately get easy money, right? This is like uh, out, of, out of conventional wisdom, right? 
it's illogical to do. So again, the strike price right now, when uh, when we issue the warrant, uh, it will be at yeah, 20 to 30 percent higher than the real stock price right now. So uh, how much money will come in if all of them exercise the warrants? So see the earlier story again here. Uh, every bond is equipped with 27 warrants and the, the exercise price is $25 a stock, right? So you have the right to buy the company stock within 10 years and the uh, exercise price is 25. So how much money coming in? So every bond is equipped with 27 warrants. Uh, let's assume that the company just issued 100,000 bonds like this. And then at the stock price, at the, uh, if they, they exercise the warrant, they have the right to buy the company stock at $25 per stock. So how much money will come in? 27 warrants per bond multiplied by 100,000 bonds multiplied by $25 per stock. So the cash that, that will come in within 10 years, if all of the warrant holders exercise their warrants, would be 67.5 million dollars. Once again, at 20, 27 warrants per bond, multiplied by 100,000 bonds, multiplied by $25 per stock. So uh, if all of them exercise their warrants, then we'll get, it will be like an incoming cash flow of 67.5 million within 10 years. Again, if all of them exercise their warrants, <clears throat> so, uh, how many shares will be outstanding after the exercise of all the warrants? Let's assume that uh, right now there are 20 million shares outstanding. Right, so, there are 20 million shares outstanding right now. So, um, yeah, we have <coughs> 27 warrants per bond. 27 warrants per bond multiplied by 100,000 bonds. Yeah, based on our previous information, the company will issue 100,000 bonds, right? And each bond will carry 27 warrants. So 27 warrants multiplied by 100,000 bonds. So you, you have, if all of them all of them exercise their warrants, we'll have additional shares of 2.7 million. Okay. So the existing shares existing number of shares uh, are 20 million shares. So 20 million plus the, the uh, additional or incoming new shares or uh, new shares that we will issue because of the exercise of those warrants. So in total, if all of them exercise their warrants, uh, the number of shares outstanding will become 22.7 million shares. So increasing by 2.7 million shares. So because bonds with warrants have a lower coupon rate, should all that be issued with warrants? So the answer is, is loud no, and we'll see why. Uh, is pertaining to the cost, we will see that the cost of warrants is quite high. So uh, we know that it's more interesting or more attractive to issue a bond with warrants. <coughs> but again, the, uh, we'll see later that the cost of warrants uh, is relatively high. Okay, so now we are going to estimate uh, the cost of capital for the, so the cost of a bond with warrants, right? cost of bond with warrants. So uh, I want to repeat a little bit about the uh, concept of the cost of capital. So the cost of capital uh, is a required return by stockholders. Right? Cost of capital is a required return by stockholders. And uh, the cost of capital comprises some components. Right? For example, the cost of debt. The cost of debt is the required return by creditors. Uh, so uh, cost of bond is the required return by bondholders. Right? Cost of equity is the required return by common stockholders. Cost of preferred equity is the required return by preferred stockholders. So it's always uh, 
now uh, equivalent right, from one component to the other. So let's see now here, what is it? This is uh, cost of bond with warrants. This is bond with warrants. Right? So there are two components in one package. We have the pure bond, we have the warrants. But when we combine it, <coughs> we call it like uh, bond with warrants. So the cost of bond with warrants is the required, is the required return by bondholders with warrants. Right. Once again, right. So the cost of bond with warrants is the required return by bondholders with warrants. So we have the uh, one package, but we have two components. So the cost of bond with warrants uh, obviously consists of the cost of pure bond and the cost of warrants. So we'll see here. Uh, so see here again. So the cost of cost of bond with warrants. It has two components. So cost of pure debt, or the uh, you can call it straight debt if you want. Right? Pure cost of pure debt, or in this case, cost of pure bond, right? Cost of pure bond or pure debt and the cost of warrants. So for this one, it's quite quite easy, quite straightforward because because we got the information already from here. Uh, earlier, yeah, we got the information here. So again, this is the uh, cost of pure bond, a cost of pure debt. <clears throat> So required return by uh, the bondholders. So uh, again, we are using a, a comparable here. Right? We're comparing. So it's, if somewhere else, uh, there's another company that's issuing a series of bond with similar risk characteristics and also similar maturity to the bond that we are going to issue. And that, that other bond uh, is having a yield to maturity of 10%. So we are assuming that if we issue uh, this bond right, with th similar risk characteristics to that one, then most likely we'll have to pay 10% if we issue it right now. Okay, so this is a required return by uh, the bondholders, that pure bondholders, that is 10%. So we don't need to calculate anything. We're using a comparable and we find out that the cost of pure bond for this kind of risk characteristics is 10%. So now we have to estimate this one, right? cost of warrants. So exact solution is very complex. So we can only get the like approximate solution uh, because there are a lot of assumptions involved. And, and of course we are using uh, like sophisticated or educated assumptions, right? but still assumptions uh, may materialize and may not. Okay. so. Uh, firstly, we have to estimate you know, the uh, stock price at the end of the uh, warrant expiration. In this case, it's 10 years. Again, once again, uh, the bonds maturity is 20 years, but the uh, expiration date for the warrant is only 10 years. Okay, so we see here failure of failure of operations at year 10 plus the uh, uh, liquid assets or short-term investments at year 10. And then we get the total value of the firm right, in the asset side minus the uh, uh, debt value, right, the liabilities, and then you get the equity. And then the value of equity should divide the number of, should be divided by the number of shares outstanding. and you'll get the uh, stock price estimate at year 10. So let's see here. Um, so let's say that we have, uh, we have valued or we have estimated the value of the company right now. You know, the value of operations right now is 500 million. So again, in real life, nobody will tell you this. You have to estimate 
the value of operations of the company by yourself by using the uh, valuation methods, right? all sorts of valuation methods, or you can hire uh, a, an appraiser right, to do the appraisal, right? official appraisal, and then you'll find a certain value. So in this story, we assume that the we have estimated the value of operations of the company right now, and that is 500 million. And the growth rate is 8% per year. Again, this is a simplification for the sake of uh, brevity, and this is this is merely an academic explanation. So in real life, you have to estimate the value of operations at year 10. So you might have to use the discounted cash flow method, right? You have to make the uh, cash flows projection, right? So cash flows projection up to year 10 or beyond or yeah, something like that. But in this case, this is a, a, a pure simplification here. So the failure of operation is assumed to grow by 8% per year. So now you could estimate the failure of operation at year 10 would be uh, 500 right now. This is the failure of operation right now. Will grow by, it will grow by 8% for 10 years. So you find an estimate here. <coughs> you find an estimate that uh, uh, the failure of operations at year 10 would be 1.07 uh, billion, right? 1.07 billion something. Okay. And so we found this one. So we just estimated this one, right? 1 point something billion, 1.08, 1.708 billion. What about this one here? So we assume that at year 10, uh, again, this is a simplification, right? The, we assume that the only short-term investments that we will have is from the exercise of the stock option and the exercise of the warrants. <clears throat> so how much again? Uh, if all of them, all of the warrant holders exercise uh, their warrants, then how much money will come in? Every bond uh, will be equipped by 27 warrants, so 27 warrants per bond, multiplied by 100,000 bonds that, that the company will issue, multiplied by 20, $25 per stock. Right? So 67.5 million. So we assume that the only short-term investments uh, that will exist at year 10 is this one. See, again, this is an academic for academic purpose. So uh, we have a lot of simplification here again. The only short-term investments that will be prevalent at year 10 is uh, the money that comes from the exercise of warrants of 67.5 million. Right? So we, we got this one also. So we sum them and we get uh, yeah, 1.15 billion. This is the value of the firm, right? according to this example. Yeah, a lot of simplifications here, but the principles remain valid, right? So you just, in real life, you just need to uh, play with the details, right? So how to estimate the failure of operations, how to estimate the short-term investments at year 10. So total failure of the firm is 1.1 billion. So now, uh, uh, what about the uh, failure of the, the, the debt, so at year 10? So we need to find out uh, the failure of debt right, at year 10. Again, for the sake of this example, the simplification, we assume that the only, <coughs> excuse me, the only debt, uh, the only debt that will exist at year 10 is this bond. I know it's, it's hard to believe, but uh, again, for the sake of example, a sim simple or simplified example, uh, so that we can focus on on the uh, concept of bond with warrants. So again, here it is assumed that at year ten, the only uh, the only existing debt would be this bond. So we have to estimate that what would be. Uh, the failure of the bond, the failure of the debt at year 10. 
So from our uh, estimation, for our, from our calculation before, we find out that uh, every year, this one will pay like 84. Right? So the value of the pure bond from the, what's that, uh, our calculation above is what, 865? So this is the value of the pure bond, uh, 865, and the bond will pay 84 and 14 cents, right? 84, 14 cents till year 20. So I don't write all of them because it will be too long, right? But you understand we have something like this. <clears throat> so we want to know the value of the debt here here, right? So we have, uh, of course, we have two methods to estimate the value of the debt at year 10. We could use the present, uh, we can use the future value from here to here, or we can use the present value from here to here, right? So there are two methods here. Uh, we have to choose one of them. Let's just choose uh, maybe the present value one. So you see here, we want to know the value of value of the debt at year 10. So again, we can use uh, the future value from here to here, right, from, from zero to 10, or the present value from 20 to 10. Let's say we use the present value, then we can do it this way, right? So the uh, coupon, at year 11, right, divided by one plus, uh, what is the cost of pure debt again? The cost of pure debt in our example is 10%. Then this is a required required return by uh, bondholders, right? So again, we look at another bond somewhere else with similar risk characteristics and the bond out there or from there is having a yield to maturity of 10%. So we are, we are taking that number here for the required return by bondholders of this kind of risk characteristics is 10%. So this is uh, from year 11, so to the power of one, because there's one movement, right? Okay, and then so on and so forth, year 12, year 13, and the last one is year 20, Year 20, this would be to the power of 10. Because it's from from year 20 to year 10, there are 10 movements, right? 10 moves. Okay, so put into Excel. So I'm looking for present value. <clears throat> Again, the cost of debt, uh, the required return by bondholders of this kind of risk characteristics. 10% in the story, uh, 10 periods, right, from from year 10 to year 20, or we find the present value from year 20 back to year 10, right, 10 years, and then 84, what's that again, 84, 14, right, the coupon payment, and at the end we'll get uh, 1,000. Okay, so we get 902, okay, 902.55 cents. Yeah. yeah, so there's a, a rounding difference, a, a rounding difference here. We are using Excel and they're using 84. We use 84.14. So let's use their number, okay, to make it like congruent to the further uh, discussion, okay? So we, we found 902, they use 901, it doesn't really matter. So this is the value of the value of the debt at year 10. And again, here we assume that the only debt, uh, the only debt outstanding at year 10 is this bond. Of course, in real life, this is not realistic. I have a lot of other liabilities, but here we assume that the only liability that, that will exist at year 10 is this bond. Well, and the value of it will be 901 at year 10, 901 million. Okay, so we again plug in the numbers here. Uh, this is again, previously we 
got the total value of the firm minus here from here right the value of debt so we we could estimate that the value of equity for stock would be 1.05 billion okay 1.05 billion at year 10 and how many uh shares outstanding at year 10 we calculated that before here right now there are 20 million shares outstanding and if all of them exercise their warrants there will be additional yeah, yeah, 27 warrants per bond multiplied by 100,000 bonds so additional 2.7 million stocks so it will be 22.7 million shares okay so the price per share the stock price is estimated to be 46.55 at year 10 at year 10 okay <clears throat> so imagine uh imagine again the if the stock price is estimated to be 46.55 at year 10 whereas the strike price or or the exercise price is 25 so what, what would be the net profit or net payoff per warren? It would be the difference, right? So the strike price is 25, and we estimate that the stock price at year 10 would be 46.55. So if we if we buy the stock at 25, uh, essentially we get we get a benefit, right, or a profit of 21.55 cents. Uh, you can imagine again, right? You have to write. You have the right to buy the stock at 25 and at year 10 the stock price is estimated to be 46.55 so you get a gain of 21.55 okay. and again how many warrants per bond so again here your payoff is estimated to be 21.55 per stock right 21.55 per stock that would be the gain uh if this estimate is uh, this valuation is true right the stock price estimate at year 10 is 46.55 while you could exercise the stock at 25 and for one bond you have 27 warrants so for one bond the payoff would be 800 sorry 581.85 cents this is for the whole one bond so once again, the potential benefit is $21.55 per stock. And every bond, again, uh, offers 27 warrants. So if you multiply them, you get, this is the uh, amount of benefit or payoff for, for one bond. So one bond has 27 warrants, right? <coughs> okay, now uh, what would be, you see, uh, uh, the benefit remember that uh the what is the, the value of the warrants right now yeah here so the value of the warrants right now based on the story here five dollars a piece and one bond has 27 warrants right 27 warrants and the value of the warrant a piece is five dollars so the uh, initial value of the warrants uh is 135 and we expect that the value of the words will go to 581 right? for the for, for one bond right again one bond has 27 warrants remember okay so we can draw what is the the what is the potential return for the warrant holders so we start with 137 right this this is the value of Warren right now, and we expect that the value of Warren will go to will grow to 581, 55, 85. So you see the logic again, right? The value of the Warren right now is 135, and based on our calculation here, it will grow to 581.85 cents uh, in 10 years or at year 10. So what is what is the return here? This is what we are going to estimate, right? 
we have to, uh, 10 years, right? So this is simply 135, the value right now, and the future value is 581.85 cents, uh, discounted back at, yeah, this is the uh, return, a uh, required return by Warren holders to the power of 10. And you can uh, use a simple or a manual calculator, or you can use Excel. So we are looking for what? Rate. Right, the rate, <coughs> number of periods, right, 10 periods, 10 years right, for the maturity of the warrants. Uh, payment, no payment here, no uh, periodic payment because we just we just uh, have the initial failure of the warren and uh, the failure estimate of the warren at year 10. And the uh, initial value is 135. It will go to, what is it again? Yeah, uh, yeah, oh. that's 81 and 85. Okay, so we get, we find out that the uh, 1573, so 15.73%. And what is it? This is the cost of, oh sorry, this is the required return by warrant holders. And what is the equivalent term for this one? Cost of warrant, yes. This is a required return by Warren holders. And essentially, this is what the cost of warrants. Or the second component of our calculation. Okay, so we find out uh, again here, 1573%. So we uh, combine, combine them, well, because here again, uh, like the cost of bond with warrants, right? It has two components, right? Cost of uh, the pure debt and the cost of warrants. And we know that the cost of cost of pure bond is 10% in the story here. Again, uh, cost of <clears throat> this bond, right? The cost of the pure bond is 10% here. So again, somewhere else, there's a similar bond with similar risk characteristics is having a yield to maturity of 10%. So we assume that the required return by bondholders of this kind of risk characteristics is 10% as well. So 10% and the cost of warrants is 15.73%. So we just need to multiply each by uh, its weight, by right? its respective weight. For example, this one, the pure bond here what was the, yeah, so the pure bond, uh, pure bond proportion would be 800, 865 per 1000, right? and the proportion of Warren would be 135 per 1000. Okay, so go back there. Okay, so 865 per 1,000, this is the proportion of the pure bond, and 135 per 1,000, this is the proportion of the warrant. So by, by doing this weighted average, we get 1077%. Okay, so this is the cost of bond with warrants, or the required return of bondholders with warrants. It has two components, right? So the cost of pure debt or pure bond and the cost of warrants that we just estimated some minutes ago. Okay, 1075, and if we see here, the cost of pure bond is 10%, right? Based on our information here. And the cost of warren, see, is 1573%. It's so expensive, right? So this actually answers uh, the question why we don't always, you know, uh, issue bonds with warrants, although it's attractive, 
because the warrants are expensive, right? The cost of warrants is expensive. Although when you combine it, of course, the uh, resulting or the combined cost would be quite mild, right? It becomes like 1077 because the proportion of the pure debt is much, much larger. Right? The proportion of pure debt in the combined package is uh, uh, much larger. So uh, that makes the uh, cost of bond with warrants not as expensive as the cost of warrants per se. Right? But it's quite expensive. And even if you see, if the cost of equity is 13.4, the cost of warrant is still more expensive than the cost of equity. So this is really expensive, right? it's expensive. The, uh, assuming that the cost of equity is 13.4, cost of warrant is still more expensive than the cost of equity. Uh, so the, again, the individual cost of warrants is so expensive. Although when you combine it with the, core, uh, the, with the cost of pure bond, uh, the combined effect would be would be milder, right? more moderate. Uh, what about if we have the tax uh, tax effect? Then here, uh, the bondholders don't don't receive eighty four, but they will receive only fifty point four because of the tax. Then we have to adjust uh, uh, our our calculation, right? right? Uh, with the tax. Uh, tax rate. So the payment. So you don't you don't receive full eighty four fourteen, but you see, receive on the uh, after tax amount, which is fifty cents and for, uh, fifty dollars and forty cents. <coughs> and also this one, the cost of debt uh, is tax deductible. So uh, it's not full ten percent, but you could. Assume that it's like 624 only. So you can recalculate everything and you could find out that the cost of bond with warrants is, is lower, right? Lower because of the uh, tax tax benefit, right? Tax deductibility of the bond, the bond with warrants. Okay, so we just need uh, uh, tax adjustment, tax rate adjustment to the calculation. So some caveat here, yeah? some caveat. Uh, we have a lot of assumptions here, right? Just approximations. Uh, yeah, so assumptions and approximations may materialize, but may not, right? So we never know, but this is like, the, the, we try to do it with our best effort at best, not in this example, but I mean, in real life, of course you try to estimate everything using the best, uh, uh, or most logical assumptions. Uh, we might need financial engineering, maybe uh, Monte Carlo simulation, for example, and other things to make it more realistic and uh, uh, more robust. Okay, so that is the second uh, second form of type of mezzanine financing, the uh, bond with warrants, uh, bond with warrants. So Again, Warren is uh, attached, right? Attached to a bond, right? The Warrens are attached to a bond. So, although they sell as one package, actually it has two components, right? The uh, pure bond and also the Warrens. So, what we are going to see next would be a bit more complicated because uh, we call it convertible bond, a convertible debt. <clears throat> so you see, what's the main difference between convertible bond and bond with warrants? So in the bond with warrants, again, although we sell as one package, actually we can see, uh, obviously we can see two components there, the pure bond and the warrants. On the other hand, for the convertible bond, we don't have uh, we don't have the obvious warrant there, but the bond itself could be converted. So this is convertible bond, right? You can see the name here. Convertible bond is uh, a bond that could be converted into stock within a certain period of time at a certain conversion ratio. Right? So now we don't have we don't have the uh, apparent separation between 
the bond and the comfortability features. Right? You see, when we talk about bond with warrants, we see the bond, we also see the warrants, but they sell as one package. Right? They are sold as one package, but we can obviously we can apparently see uh, the bond and also the warrants. On the other hand, for comfortable bond, we only see the bond, right? We only see one thing here, the bond. But actually the bond, based on the contract, the bond can be converted into common stocks within, again, a certain period of time at a certain price or a certain conversion ratio, right? Conversion ratio. So we'll see an example to make it clear. Let's say we have a 20 year bond 20-year bond and the uh, coupon coupon rate <coughs> is 8.5 percent and this is callable callable so it has a call provision right again call provision means uh, that the issuer or the company could recall the bond right before its maturity so we follow the story here the bond will sell at 1000 the, the face value is 1000 and here's the information again, the strike debt issue, again, the pure bond issue without, without this comfortability facility would require a 10% coupon. So again, I think we are using a comparable here. We look at somewhere else. If there's another company that has issued a, a series of bond that has similar characteristics to this bond like our bond uh the other that other company's bond is having a yield to maturity of 10 percent. so you can see right if we issue the bond right now what would be uh the required return by bondholders of course it's 10 percent, right because we see somewhere else another bond with uh, similar risk characteristics is enjoying enjoying a, a yield to maturity of 10 percent. so the when we issue the bond most likely we have to pay a coupon rate of uh, 10%, right? The, what's that? The required return, or required return by the stockholders, uh, sorry, required return by the bondholders would be 10% for this kind of risk characteristics. Okay, so call protection is five years. So you see here, uh, <clears throat> the call protection is five years. So. The maturity of the bond is 20 years, but after five years, the company has the right. So having the right doesn't mean that it has to be executed, right? So the company has the right after five years to recall the bond before its maturity, right? Before 20 years, but after five years, it could recall the bond should the company want it. Right? But see here, uh, if they recall the bond before maturity, they have to pay 1100. But if they redeem the bond at maturity, they will pay 1000. This makes sense, right? Because you're enjoying, uh, you're, you're enjoying the uh, coupon payment. Suddenly the, com the company recalls the bond. You, you'll be unhappy. So your, your unhappiness has to be compensated, right? So they will redeem the bond before maturity at 1100 but they will redeem the bond at maturity uh, at 1,000. <clears> so this is secret information here. The company will, will uh, call the bonds if the conversion value is more than 1,200. So again, uh, we are talking about the uh, an academic example to prove a point and to tell you the principles of, of, of uh, this mechanism, okay? In real life, Nobody will ever tell you this. How can a company, can you imagine a company uh, announces that they will recall the bond uh, after five years? If the conversion value is more than 1200, this will never be announced, okay? So uh, in reality, you have to guess, right? So you are guessing, the company is guessing as well. So we are making like sophisticated valuations uh, by both no, both, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, both parties, right? Both entities, the bondholders and also the company. Okay, so additional information here: the current stock price, current stock price, 
is $20. Uh, cost of equity, the R RS, required return by stockholders, or the cost of equity is 13.4%. And then the growth rate is 8%. Growth rate of the company is 8%. And this important information, conver conversion ratio is 40 shares. So one bond, <coughs> uh, one bond could be uh, converted into 40 stocks, right? So we call it conversion ratio. I think there's one, one piece of information that we need to know is the expiration of uh, expiration of the convertible facility, convertibility facility. Like similar to the case of Warren, you see, uh, we, we talked about some minutes ago. Uh, in our example, in our previous example, the bonds maturity was 20 years, but the Warren maturity was 10 years. So we have to assume the same thing here, I guess. So the bond, uh, the maturity of the bond is 20 years. This is a 20 year bond, right? But uh, the, the expiration date or the expiration of the convertibility facility is 10 years, right? So although the bond is one, <clears throat> but it has like uh, two what's that, abstract components, right? Two abstract components inside the bond, right? The uh, pure bond with uh, with a maturity of twenty years, and also the convertibility facility or convertibility feature that has uh, an expiration of ten years. Okay, so how much is the uh, what's that conversion price? We know that conversion. Uh, conversion uh, ratio is 40 right, from here, from this information. So uh, if you want to execute uh, this, what's that? you want to execute this option, you can convert one bond into 40 stocks, right? So 40. And then the uh, face value or the power value of the bond is 1000. Right? So 1000, and you could imagine, right? So uh, the face value of the bond is 1,000, and one bond could be converted into 40 stocks. So of course, the uh, conversion price is $25 per stock. So uh, this is equivalent to the what's that? The uh, strike price in a warrant, right? But uh, this is more subtle, right? Because again. The two components are, uh, what's that, are uh, strongly bound into the bond, right? So the bond, the pure bond, and the convertibility feature. Uh, the, our previous example saw the bond with warrants, so they're more obvious, right? They're, they're two obvious components there, bond and worlds, but here we don't have another obvious component, but we know that we have the bond and we have the convertibility facility, but they are, uh, what's that? They're, they're jointly uh, made as one, right? as one bond. But we, we could estimate this one. The conversion price is about 25 because the face value of the bond is 1,000 and one bond could be converted into 40 stocks. And similar to the case of uh, the Warren strike price, conver conversion price is usually set at 20 to 30% above the current stock price. This is common sense, right? So if the conversion price is 25 and the current stock price, current stock price right now is, is 15, then you still have to wait, right? So the conversion price is 25. If you do it right now, the value of the stock is about 25 that you have to pay. But actually, the real stock price right now is only 15. So of course, you will not do it. Right? You still have to wait. This is quite uh, normal and common. OK, so <clears throat> now we have to determine again the uh, two, com uh, two abstract components. So this is a bit more complicated because we have the bond only. So we don't have bond with warrants, right? We have only one bond, but 
within the bond we know we know that we know that we have the pure bond component and we have uh, convertibility feature or facility okay so <clears throat> uh, again we want to sell we want to sell it at a thousand the total value is a thousand now we want to know what would be the uh, proportion of pure bond and uh, that of the convertibility facility or feature. Okay, so now we have to imagine uh, following the information. What's the information again? 20 years, 8.5% coupon. So 20 years. <clears throat> so the uh, face value is 1000. So 8.5% of 1000 is 85. So the coupon rate is 8.5%, right? 8.5% of the par value or face value is 85. So it, it will pay 85 until year 20. And here we have the information that, uh, yeah, here. So uh, the required return by uh, pure bondholders is 10%. Again, this is the required return by bondholders of this kind of risk characteristics is 10%. So again, yeah, I repeat this over and over again to, to make sure that you understand this one. So if we look somewhere else, another company with another bond with similar risk characteristics as our bond, and that that com that other company's bond is enjoying a yield to maturity of ten percent, then for sure we can assume that the required return by our bondholders with this kind of risk characteristics is also ten percent. Right. So, uh, so what is the value of the pure bond? Yeah, we can put into Excel. Uh, simply the present value of it. Right? So what is the uh, cost of pure debt? Cost of the pure bond required return by bondholders of this kind of risk characteristics. So the pure bond, 10%, uh, right? Cost of pure bond is 10%. Uh, 20 years payment is 85, 8.5% of 1,000. And the future value, or the face value is 1,000. Okay, so we just found out that the value of the pure bond is uh, 874, eh, 872 and 30 cents. This is the value of the pure bond. So uh, consequently, we can estimate easily, right? Because we, we, we sell at 1000, the whole package. And we just estimated that the value of pure bond is 872 and, seven, and 20 cents. So the value of uh, this one, the uh, convertibility feature or convertibility facility is 127. Right here, see? So if this is like, uh, so 127. seventy. This one. 872 something, 30 maybe, yeah, okay, so, so we found the uh, <coughs> value of each component, again the component is quite abstract here, we don't have uh, obvious separation between the two components because they are, uh, they are fitly joined as one, okay, so uh, next, we have to estimate the conversion value, right? Uh, we know the conversion value right now. Conversion value right now is, uh, what's it again? 25 times, uh, sorry, the, what's the conversion value again? Uh, what is the stock price? Oh yeah, here, 20. So you see the conversion ratio is 40, right? 
So now imagine again, you have, if you have one bond such as this, the bond could be converted into 40 stocks if you want to execute the contract, right? So 40 stocks and every stock, every, every stock has a, a value or a current price of $20. So you know that this is 800, right? The conversion value right now is 800, right? 40 times 20. So one bond can be converted into 40 stocks and the stock price right now per stock per share is $20. So you know that the conversion price, sorry, the conversion value right now is 800. What would be the conversion value at year 10? Right, uh, you could estimate it. Again, this is a pure simplification we got the growth rate information, eight percent. In real life, you might have to estimate, you know, every year, uh, in a more manual setting to make sure that they are they are accurate from time to time. But here we've, we we just follow the information that the growth rate is eight percent. So this is quite uh, easy. So again, the conversion ratio is forty. So one bond can be converted into forty stocks, and uh, the stock price is $20 per share, right? And it's growing by 8%. It's growing by 8% for 10 years. Why 10 years again? Because again, we, we assume here that the, uh, the bond will mature in 20 years, but the convertibility facility will expire after 10 years, right? So the ex expiration uh, date is only 10 years, not 20 years, okay? So here. <clears throat> so we estimate that the conversion value at year 10 would be uh, yeah, 1,727 and 14. Okay, here's the problem, right? Based on the information, this is the secret information. Uh, you know that the company will call the bond, right? recall the bond before maturity. They will execute the call provision. If the conversion, if the conversion value is more than 1,200, and we just calculated that the conversion value at year 10 would be 1,700. So if you know this secret information, you know exactly that you will never, you will never reach year 10 because the, the company will recall the bond whenever the conversion value uh, reaches or exceeds 1,200. So you will never arrive here because you know the secret information that the company will recall the bond if the conversion value exceeds or, or reaches 1200. That's why you see in real life, nobody will ever tell you the, uh, the conversion value at which the company will uh, redeem the bond before its time, before its maturity, right? It's like secret information. You have to guess uh, when no, the company uh, is going to redeem the bond before maturity. But again, here, a kind of example you find out. So you will never get there. So obviously, you are pessimistic that you will ever uh, execute the comfortability at year 10 because you know that the company will have uh, redeemed the bond whenever the conversion value reaches 1200. Then what is it? Uh, what is the uh, logical estimate here? So you have to guess, right? <coughs> so this situation is very different from the bond with warrants. So bond with warrants, you see that uh, two uh, obvious separation, like obvious components. You have the bond and then you have the warrants. So whatever, whatever uh, is happening to the bond doesn't really affect the warrant because even the warrants can be sold separately right, on, on a stock exchange. So whatever is happening to the bond, for example, the bond is redeemed before its time, uh, the warrants are still prevalent, right? the warrants are still uh, outstanding, so there's no direct effect. But here, we don't have a warrant. Remember, we don't have a warrant. We only have one bond. If the bond is redeemed before maturity, then the convertibility would be gone. You see here, so now we have to, uh, quote unquote, 
uh, play uh, play a mind game with the company because you see you want to get uh, as much benefit as possible from the convertible bond. If the stock price is uh, so attractive, then you convert the bond into stock, right? Of course, right, you want to get uh, you want to gain the benefit as much as possible. However, now we have to think about the company as well. If the company thinks that uh, it will be more beneficial to redeem the bond immediately, then they will do it, especially if the, the immunity period has uh, has lapsed or has expired, so they could do it. Right? So it's like a, a competition who is doing it faster, right? So whether you want to, uh, when you want to uh, convert the bond into stocks, but the company wants to redeem the bond before its time, if it's possible and beneficial to the firm. So we we want to avoid a situation where you want to uh, convert the bond into stock, but it's too late because the company decided to redeem the bond earlier. So this is like a, a competition of, of timing, right? But again, here in this academic example, uh, it is informed that the company will Recall the uh, recall the convertible bond uh, if the conversion value has reached uh, twelve hundred. Right? So we could guess, we could estimate the timing. What is the the most probable time? Right here, uh, what is the initial conversion value? Initial conversion value again here. Uh, one bond can be converted into forty stocks. And the stock price right, right now is 20, right? So 40 stocks for one bond multiplied by 20. So the uh, current conversion value is 800. So the question is, when will it go to 1200? When? If the conversion ratio, so the conversion, rate, uh, conversion value is growing at eight percent see the information here right the growth rate is eight percent okay when will it happen this is something that we have to uh, look for we have to search uh using excel but here the logic again the conversion ratio right now is 800 right because uh one stock one bond can be converted into 40 stocks and the stock price right, right now is eight uh, is twenty, so eight hundred, right? Forty times twenty, and we know that uh, the company will redeem or will recall the bond uh, whenever the conversion ratio uh, reaches twelve hundred. So we, the question is when. So we use Excel. So number of periods here. <clears throat> number of periods. So what is the growth rate in this case? 8% per year, no payment. We start from what, 800, conversion conversion value of 800. And we want to know when it will become 1200. And what is it? So 5.27 years. At 5.27 years, if we round it up, it will be like six years. We round it up, right? Six years. Okay, so five twenty-seven. So we round it up to six years. Okay, so uh, now we have to find out, right? What is the conversion value at year six? Okay, so again, so we predict, right, based on. Uh, our calculation, this will happen at year six. So uh, based on our, our calculation, our secret information, we know that this bond will never last until year 10 because the company, and we know this, this secret information, the company will redeem or recall the bond when the conversion ratio exceeds 1200. And we know that this will happen at year six. So now we want to estimate what is the, what what exactly is the conversion value at year six? So again, right now, 
uh, one bond can be converted into 40 stocks multiplied by $20 stock price per share, right? the, the price per share. So one bond into 40 stocks and the stock price is $20. So it's 800 right now. It's growing by 8%. The growth rate is 8% to the power of six because we want to know the conversion value at year six. And we find out that this is uh, 1,269. Okay, this conversion value. So I want to draw it uh, on the blank paper here so you could imagine better. So you see, when you get the stock, how much is the, when you bought the stock, oh, it's 1,000, right? <clears throat> because it's one package, 1,000 has two components, remember? The, uh, what was it again? Yeah, here. 872 and one, uh, 127. But uh, we talked about the one package is 1,000. So you you bought it at 1,000. And then you will receive, what, uh, 85? So you bought it at 1,000, then you get 85, 85, 85, and, and so forth. Right? But we find out that based on our secret information that the company will recall or redeem the bond when the conversion value exceeds 1200 and we know that this will happen at year six so what will you get at year six 85 and of course you want to uh you want to redeem uh, sorry you want to exercise the uh convertibility feature before the company redeems the uh, bond before the time Understand? So you have to be faster than the company, right? So you uh, you want to uh, execute the the contract, uh, the convertibility feature, before the company uh, exercises its call provision. So how much will you make if you do it precisely at year six? You you get how much again? Uh, here, here, one one bond can be converted into forty stocks. The price right now is 20 per, per share. It's going by 8% for six years. So 1,269.50. You see the logic again, right? You put the stock at 1,000, you get 85, 85, 85, and so on, right? And 85, and you convert the bond into stock. And this is the value. Right, because it's like uh, one bond can be converted into 40 stocks. The price of the stock right now is $20 a piece, but it's growing by 8% for six years. Okay, so now we'll determine, right, how much, how much is your uh, return, right? How much is your required return right, of the, uh, this bond with convertibility? Right. So the cost of or the required return by bondholders, comfortable or we can call it simply comfortable bond. So bond plus comfortability feature, we call it what right, comfortable bond, right? CB. How much is the return? Right. So we can estimate here. Uh, rate okay number of periods yeah we believe that within six years uh, the bond would be recalled so we want to we want to convert the bond into stocks before the company exercises its call provision right we expect that this will happen at year six when the conversion value exceeds 1200 right? uh, so payment <coughs> uh, we get 85. A present value, we bought we bought the bond at one thousand, the whole package, right? And uh, so you get, you see here, you get 85, 85, 85, 85. At the end, uh, you convert you convert the bond into stocks, uh, and you get twelve 
1269.50. Right, so once again, you get 85, the coupon uh, coupon income, uh, 85, 85, and so on. But at year six, you decide to convert quickly, convert the, the bond into stocks. And the conversion value would be, again, uh, one bond can be converted into 40 stocks. The price of the stock right now is $20, so it's already 800, right? And that is going by 8% for six years. And it is 12, 1269.50 cents. Okay. Okay, so we find out that the uh, cost of the, what's that? The required return that you enjoy here, right? The uh, required return, required return of the comfortable bondholders is 11%. 11.83 percent and what is it again required return by convertible bond holders is the cost of convertible bond once again right what what are what are we estimating here this is the return <clears throat> to be enjoyed or you can call it required return by the convertible bond holders and of course the required return by convertible bond holders is the cost of Convertible bond is 11.83%. Okay, so if we see here again, uh, uh, cost of the pure bond, uh, cost of the pure bond without convertibility feature is 10% in this story. Again, we're using comparable, so uh, this required return by bondholders without comfortability feature of this kind of risk characteristics is 10% in the story. And the cost of comfortable bond, like we just calculated before, the cost of comfortable bond is 11.83%. This is the required return by comfortable bond holders, that what we estimated in the previous slide, right? And the cost of equity is 13.4% in the story. And what about if this is after tax? So we have to again readjust. Uh, we don't receive 85, but we receive 51 instead. So only 51. So uh, <coughs> the required return by required return by convertible bondholders is not 11.8 percent, but 8.71 percent. And this is again the cost of convertible bond. Uh, after tax, after tax, if you adjust it with tax. Okay, so uh, some notes here. Uh, there's some caveat or some uh, notes that we have to take into account. Here, uh, the cost of equity is not affected by the addition of convertible debt. Right, of course, right? Uh, the, the simplification. But usually, if you add more and more debts, uh, at, you borrow more money, again, the company becomes riskier. And if the company becomes riskier, the required return by stockholders will also increase. And so is, uh, so does the cost of equity, right? So because cost of equity is the required return by uh, stockholders. And also this one here, most comfortables most comfortable bonds are subordinated, so have a lower rank. It's riskier, right? Lower, what's that? Lower priority or lower rank uh, than other debts. So, uh, so uh, the assumption of cost of the pure debt should be more careful. But in this example, of course, we are quite we are quite relaxed and and uh, not really paying attention to details because again, this is an academic example, but in real life, you can imagine, right? If you issue comfortable bond, then uh, even the the uh, cost of pure debt may be higher than uh, maybe the other or the comparable bond. So if you want to make a comparable, have to be careful. We have, the, it's highly recommended that you also look for a comparable somewhere else uh, that is a convertible bond as well. So the comparison 
is equal, right, and and uh, logical. So this is a matter of assumption, right? If you if you compare uh, two things that are not really similar, then uh, of course the comparison is biased, right? And also the uh, the number that that you take as a as a comparable is biased, right? Could be biased, so have to be more uh, detailed. Okay, and especially comfortable debts are usually subordinated, so it's riskier because the rank is lower. When the convertible bond is converted, the debt ratio will, will decrease. You can imagine, right? The, the bond will become stock, so the debt ratio will decrease. And hopefully, the firm's financial risk uh, will decrease or is considered lower as well because now the bond uh, will be converted into stocks. Right? So the, the amount of debt will decrease automatically. So besides cost, what other factors here? Uh, so future needs of equity capital. Uh, remember that if we exercise the uh, warrants, we bring in new equity. We saw this example. Right? Uh, so you see warrants, again, what, what is a warrant? Warrant is the right to buy. The right to buy uh, a company's equity at certain price within a, a certain period of time. A convertible bond is the right to convert a bond into a certain number of stocks within a certain period of time at a certain price or a certain conversion ratio, right? So uh, if they exercise the warrants, they buy uh, new equity, right? So uh, there will be new equity, but this one, convertible, uh, no new money coming in because the bond is simply converted into stocks. So the status of financing uh, has changed right from debt to equity, but there's no incoming money, unlike warrants. In warrants, they have the right to buy uh, company stocks. So there will be like money coming in. Okay, and for both cases, right, actually, either or for both cases, uh, it will it will make the debt ratio lower. Right? For warrants, you can imagine, they execute the warrants, so they will buy like uh, new equity. So the the number of number of outstanding shares will increase, the amount of equity will increase, thus increasing also the proportion of equity in the financing. Right, on the right hand side of the balance sheet. And similarly here, for the convertible bond, if you convert the bond into stocks, of course, the proportion of equity will increase and the debt ratio will decline. So convertible, convertible conversion removes some debt, right? Uh, but the exercise of warrants doesn't. But the effect is the same, you could imagine We'll draw quickly here. If we have uh, uh, for the case of warrants, the liabilities remain the same, but we have uh, if they exercise the warrants, we have additional equity. So the proportion of equity will increase, but the the amount of liabilities remains the same, but the amount of equity will increase, thereby increasing the proportion of equity in the capital structure. <clears throat> what about the convertible bond? Convertible bond here, if we convert liabilities, right? so uh, there are some parts of the liabilities that disappear because this is converted into equity. So you see here, with the convertible bond, uh, if you convert the bond into stocks, then the amount of liabilities will decline. And the, uh, and the amount of equity will increase. But if stock price doesn't rise over time, then uh, none, neither of neither worlds nor comfortables would be exercised. Of course, right? If the exercise price or the conversion price is still higher than uh, the existing stock price, then 
the warrant will not be exercised and the comfortability bond will not be executed as well. Okay, we saw this one before. Uh, yeah, most comfortables are callable, so they are equipped with code provision. Uh, so we have to be more careful because now the company has the right to redeem the bond before maturity. Uh, warrants are separate. <coughs> Again, you see, bond with warrants. The bond itself might carry uh, the uh, call provision, but the warrants, the warrants do not, right? Warrants typically have uh, a shorter maturity than a convertible bond. Warrants usually provide for fewer common shares. This is the uh, typical practice in the industry. Of course, this might differ from one case to another, but this is a typical or the common common fact. So you can call it common fact. So warrants usually provide for fewer common shares compared to convertible bonds. Uh, bonds with warrants typically have much higher flotation costs. Uh, yeah, so because you see, uh, with a convertible bond, you simply convert the bond into stocks. But warrants, it means that you, uh, if you execute the warrants, it means that you buy the stocks, right? You buy new stocks. You have the right to buy and you execute it. Right? And bond with warrants are often used by uh, startup firms. Uh, this is, I think, quite quite understandable because uh, a startup firm, the future of a startup firm is quite uncertain. So to be attractive, if if the startup company wants to borrow money, then uh, most likely it has to equip it with warrants to make it more attractive. And also this this fact, you see agency costs, this is quite quite uh, uh, important because uh, you see this psychological you know, uh, situation in the market, right? Uh, if you borrow money, right? If you borrow money, you could issue, for example, uh, a certain bond you can borrow money from a bank or anything. But in, in this example, if you issue a series of bonds, uh, you could use you can use, you could use the proceed from the borrowing to invest in risky projects. Risky projects, right? If the <clears throat> if the projects are successful, then uh, you could repay your bondholders, right? The uh, coupon payment and also the principal payment. But if the projects fail, then there's a possibility that the bondholders get nothing because, of course, you you liquidate the assets, but uh, there's a possibility that they don't get the full amount uh, of their lending to you. Right. So, because of this suspicion, uh, it will be more attractive or more interesting, especially for a small, smaller or less famous company or startup firm, to issue uh, issue a series of bond with warrants, right? Because if you have, uh, if you issue warrants or you issue comfortable debt, essentially they have the chance uh, to buy uh, your equity, right? And if, if the projects are successful, most likely your stock price will increase. And if they have warrants, they can buy, uh, they can buy your equity <coughs> at, a, at a contract price, at a strike price, which is lower than uh, your stock price at that time, right? Maybe five years or ten years from now, so they could get your stock at a lower price than uh, your market price at that time, and they will get uh, capital gains there, right? Or comfortable debt would be the same. So if if your projects are successful, then uh, the stock price your stock price might increase, and they could convert. Uh, that, that could convert their bond into your stocks. So it's more attractive to them to minimize the agency cost. And also in uh, related to the agency cost, we have information asymmetry here, or asymmetric information, because if you issue a uh, stock, usually uh, the signal is not as good as that if you uh, issue bond, right? Because 
you can watch my videos on capital structure. We talk uh, <clears throat> in more details about this uh, in that video, the capital structure. Um, if you issue stock, usually the signal is not necessarily negative, but uh, the signal is not as good as uh, that when you issue bonds, right? Or you borrow money. Because if you borrow money, it's assumed that you have like uh, good potential, right? Good, good future projects. That's why you borrow money uh, and you don't want to share ownership with someone else. And you imagine, right? You borrow money, you use the money to finance your projects and you don't want to share ownership with new people. So usually the signal is, is stronger, it's better. But if you, if suddenly you issue, uh, 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 issue new stocks, then uh, it would be more suspicious because they would think that why, why you are so kind you know, to uh, invite other people to be owners? There might be something behind it. Maybe you have like some uh, risky projects that you want to share. You, know, the, you want to share the riskiness with other people. So again, issuing new stock usually uh, is usually sending. Uh, like not as good signal as when you issue like bonds or you borrow money from a bank. Okay, so uh, so you see here, you think the company will issue new stock only if the future prospect is not that good. They're, they're suspicious, right, about you because suddenly you invite other people to be new to be like uh, uh, owners, right? Okay, so. Uh, what is the strategy here? You know that issuing, again, issuing uh, new stocks is not sending a good signal. So you can do it like through the back door. This is a strategy. How to do it, of course, with this one, right? Warrens and Comfortable Bond. So if you sell at the bond with Warrens and uh, there's a, a strong likelihood that they will exercise all the Warrens, so you have new equity coming in new money from equity coming in, right? So, uh, of course, the consequence would be you increase the amount of equity. So you're doing it through the back door. And similarly, if you use the uh, comfortable bond, the same thing here. <clears throat> so you're is issuing a series of bond. So it's not a stock. So the signal is good, right? You're issuing a series of bond. But you see, the bond is comfortable, meaning that uh, sometime in the future, the bond might be converted into stocks. Uh, the series of bonds will be converted into stocks. Okay, so uh, suddenly you have like declining amount of liabilities and increasing amount of equity. So you're essentially you are issuing equity. You are issuing uh, new equity without without. Uh, 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 what's that? Obvious attention, right? Without public attention, because actually you are issuing uh, a series of bond right now, or you are issuing uh, a series of bond with warrants, or a series of comfortable bonds, and someday in the future, you will have like, additional equity without even telling the people that you are issuing uh, new shares. So you could avoid the negative signal uh, intertwined with issuing new stocks. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting discussion today. Uh, we discussed the hybrid financing or mezzanine financing. It's, it has become more and more popular because uh, uh, the the speed, right? the, the speed at which you want to raise funds has increased as well. And sometimes if you go to the uh, classical or traditional financing mechanisms, it will take like, longer time. So using the mezzanine uh, alternative, you might be able to uh, raise money faster. Thank you very much for uh, bearing with me today and see you in our next uh, videos. Thank you.